Hi. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank the organizers for putting this panel together and for inviting me to present uh, some of uh, the work that I've been doing. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how to assess health and climate impacts of wood fuels and other household energy options. Uh, I'll give some basic background on the topic and then talk about some research that I've done along with some of the colleagues named here. So uh, to start with a little bit of background, uh, roughly 2.3 billion people worldwide rely on wood fuels. And when I use the term wood fuels, I mean uh, unprocessed firewood, charcoal, and fuels derived from wood waste. This reliance has profound health impacts worldwide and responsible for about 4% of global mortality. That's a lot. That's more than uh, other diseases that we hear about uh, that we're concerned about in the tropics, things like TB, HIV, and malaria. It's on the same scale as those combined. Um, burning wood and charcoal releases about 20% of total global particulate matter, um, or PM 2.5, uh, which is largely the, the pollutant that's responsible for these health impacts, although there are a few others that I'll point out later. Uh, in terms of the, the volume of wood that we're talking about, roughly half of the global wood harvest ends up under somebody's cooking fire. Half is used as fuel. So it's a tremendous amount of wood. Um, it's roughly 7% of global primary energy, which is about the same scale as hydropower, nuclear power, wind, and solar combined. So it's a tremendous amount of energy, but we don't really think of it as such. Um, it has impacts on the climate. About 2% of total anthropogenic global forcing in any given year is attributable to this sector. And when we break it down into specific pollutants, about 40% of global black carbon aerosols, which are particularly potent short-term climate forcer, uh, that if we're moved, or if we reduce emissions, uh, we could have an immediate impact on warming. And we think, uh, if we look toward the future, uh, by 2050, the number of users globally will decrease, but not everywhere. And specifically in Sub-Saharan Africa, the numbers are projected to increase, at least for another generation or so. Okay, so now a little bit of a uh, detail about how wood fuels impact climate and health. So if we think about the way trees grow, uh, they require three key ingredients. Uh, CO2, which they fix to, to build their structure, sunlight and water and that leads to biomass growth. When I talk about biomass, I mean largely uh, woody biomass, so, so trees. Um, people harvest those trees and they bring them home to, uh, to use in their cooking fires, and that removes carbon from the landscape, the carbon that was fixed. Um, and then those biomass is burned. If there's charcoal, then it's not burned directly, it's first pyrolyzed, so there are additional emissions from that process. Uh, but when burning, particularly in small scale devices like the one shown here, uh, it's impossible to completely combust the fuel. Okay, so we have partial combustion, which leads to CO2, that arrow coming out of the top. And then you also have incomplete combustion and products of incomplete combustion or PICs, which include things like methane, which is a greenhouse gas, uh, particulate matter that I mentioned earlier, um, constituents of particulate matter like black carbon, BC, or organic carbon aerosols. Both of these are climate forcers. So in addition to harming health through particulate matter, you're also having an impact on climate through BC and OC emissions. You also see a significant amount of carbon monoxide or CO. That's a, uh, toxic for people to breathe. And then a whole group of other chemicals that we just categorize as NMHCs or non-methane hydrocarbons, uh, which include carcinogenic um, compounds like benzene and um, PAH or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, that also carry health impacts. Okay, so two pathways, one to complete combustion which releases CO2, which is a greenhouse gas itself, and then incomplete combustion, which releases a whole mess of other things that, that we'd rather avoid being exposed to and putting into the atmosphere. Okay, so some of that CO2 remains in the atmosphere and contributes to global warming. And then some of those products of incomplete combustion, like I said, are also climate forcers and contribute to global warming. All right. Other CO2, however, can be sequestered or re reabsorbed by new biomass growth. Okay, so the exact climate impact will depend on how much biomass is allowed to regrow and how much is, uh, is remain in the atmosphere. That specific question is key to understanding the overall climate impact of, of wood fuel use. Um, and that uh, uh, my colleague and fellow panelist, Adrian Gilardi, will talk about uh, in a few minutes. 
Okay, so here we have it laid out how burning wood fuels can contribute to climate change and how it also contributes through a similar process, through inc incomplete combustion, to uh, climate change. Okay, so how can we reduce these impacts? So clean cooking options uh, reduce these impacts. And of course, the first thing you might ask is, what is clean? So in this specific context, uh, we're following the World Health Organization's uh, definitions. They define clean based on emissions of particulate matter, which I mentioned earlier, and carbon monoxide emissions, and how those emissions are likely to result in, first, exposure to people, and second, health outcomes as a result of that exposure. And only a few technologies fall into the WHO's categories of clean. Um, solar and electric cookers, which are illustrated at the top, Gaseous fuels like biogas, natural gas, and liquefied petroleum gas, or LPG. Uh, you can see a picture of LPG uh, in the right center. Um, pellet fuels, which are solid fuels, but only when they're burned in specific types of stoves that blow air into uh, the combustion area that really cleans things up. So what are called forced draft stoves. An example of that is that stove with a, that's shaped like a red cylinder in the lower left. And then alcohol-based stoves and fuels uh, I have a picture of that on the on the lower uh, on, the, on the bottom. So just these types. And note, there's no sort of traditional wood or charcoal stove at all here because none of them achieve this uh, WHO definition of clean. Okay. If we look at how cooking fuels have evolved in low middle income countries, we can see that there is already a transition underway. According to WHO estimates, about 1.2 billion people gained access to clean stoves in the 10 years between 2010 and 2020. And if we break it down and look at what fuels people actually started to use, um, LPG accounts for about three quarters of this growth in access to clean fuels. And grid-based electricity, mainly generated from fossil fuels, accounts for most of the rest. If we look to the future, according to, again, WHO projections, by 2040, we expect there to be about a billion more people in low and middle income countries uh, with access to LPG and electricity for cooking. Um, however, like I mentioned, in Sub-Saharan Africa, wood fuel users could still increase by as much as 350 million people in that same time period. So that's another population of the U.S. worth of people using polluting fuels. Okay, of course, that's just a forecast. It's not necessarily going to happen, and it will take policy changes and major investments in order for that not to happen. And to counter this trend, many African countries are actually looking into and developing policies to increase the number of people that cook with LPG and grid electricity. Now, as I explained, LPG is a fossil fuel. It's derived from petroleum or natural gas. There are different processes. Um, and grid electricity, though not everywhere, largely is generated from fossil fuels and will continue to be for the near future at least, particularly in countries where electricity is in widespread use. I'm, I'm thinking about South Africa, India, China. So most of their grid is coal-based. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a clean or renewable grid. So we can ask, how would this transition impact public health, both the transition that's already underway and ones that, and the transition that could accelerate as a result of policy changes? So basically, what are the impacts when billions of people go from cooking with wood fuels, like this picture on the left, to either LPG, the picture in the center, or grid-based electricity, the picture on the right? Okay, so this is the question uh, my colleagues and I tried to address. To answer this question, we gathered fuel-specific life cycle data and developed three scenarios and applied those scenarios to 77 different low- and middle-income countries. Uh, one scenario is a business as usual, which is based on current trends. Another scenario uh, looked at full transitions from polluting fuels to either LPG, a mix of electricity and LPG, or all electricity. And a third set of scenarios were intermediate, somewhere in between business as usual and these full transitions. Uh, the life cycle or LCA inputs used a global mix of production sources. So we looked at like a global average of petroleum and, and the, the Im impacts of petroleum extraction and transportation. And the same for grid electricity. We looked at each country's specific mix of um, sources that went to the grid. And then we took a set of existing models that are designed to look at climate health and other impacts, and we modified them so that they could accept our scenarios. Uh, the first is a climate model that was developed by um, Chris Smith and colleagues from the University of Leeds, um, a health model uh, that's developed by uh, Ajay Pilarsetti 
uh, from UC Berkeley. And then uh, we also modeled costs and benefits uh, using a model called BARHAP uh, that was developed by WHO in collaboration with uh, Ipsita Das and Mark Julian from Duke University. So I'm going to go through the, the details of the, the climate model, or the results of the climate model, uh, and show a little bit about the health. Uh, I won't have time to show the, the cost and benefits model, but, but I'd be happy to discuss during the discussion. Okay, just to show you an example of what these transitions look like, this shows fuel transitions in Nigeria. I just chose it randomly uh, as an illustration. Uh, on the left, you see the business as usual, which, which is directly from WHO's analyses. Uh, and then we tweaked that so we could have either an intermediate or a full transition, as I explained, and that's what's shown in the center and the right, respectively. And just to jump ahead to the results, and, and uh, I'm ignoring or not, not discussing a year's worth of effort that went through, uh, that went into, into getting these results together. Um, and what you're looking at here are graphs of temperature change relative to business as usual. Uh, so you can see they, there are curves that go below the axis, implying that they're negative. So what we're showing here, using the climate model that I explained, is that each one of these scenarios results in a slightly cooler future than we would have if we followed the business as usual pathway. So despite the fact that we're relying on fossil fuels, we're actually doing less climate forcing. We're having a lower impact on the climate uh, because of the way that we're changing the emissions of pollutants. And I'll tell you what pollutants in a second. Uh, and then the graph on the right shows you the regional contributions to this overall temperature difference uh, for the full transition to LPG. And here you can see, and this is significant, that Sub-Saharan Africa, because it is projected to have the dirtiest future under business as usual, has the most impact on cooling under a full transition to cleaner fuels. Okay, so some other key findings, and here I'll go through some of the pollutants uh, that actually have this impact on uh, less warming. Uh, so a full transition to clean household energy in low and middle income countries by 2040 would result in 95% reduction in carbon monoxide, particulate matter, BC and OC aerosols, and non-methane uh, volatile organic compounds uh, from cooking. So near elimination, not full, but near elimination of all of those pollutants. Um, black carbon declines by nearly a million tons a year by 2040. Organic carbon declines by still more. And the cumulative emissions of well-mixed greenhouse gases, which include CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, decrease by three gigatons. So the overall emissions added up over the entire time period uh, reduced by about three gigatons. Um, and what we find is global mean temperature is about five millikelvin lower than under business as usual. That doesn't seem like a lot, but over just 20 years, it's a significant contribution to cooling. Okay, and I mentioned that we did model health impacts as well. This just shows you a specific country. We didn't do this for all countries. Uh, we, we modeled country by country. Uh, and this shows a, an example from Ghana. So the model abode, it aggregates mortality impacts from six health outcomes that are related to exposure to smoke from solid fuels. And what we find is that under business as usual, mortality from those six, uh, six health outcomes would increase by 1,400 per year. Um, but other, under the intermediate full transition, where we have between four and seven million fewer households using solid fuels, we find mortality declines between four and 7,000 Per people per year. So it's not fully eliminated. There are other causes that contribute to these mortality outcomes. Um, but we're saving thousands of lives per year by the time this transition is complete. Okay, a couple closing thoughts. So transitions from fuel, wood, and charcoal to LPG or grid electricity would result in, firstly, we think near-term cooling, about five millikelvin, so not a lot, but it's not warmer, it's cooler by 2040 near elimination of most health damaging pollutants. So we're emitting a lot less compounds, a lot fewer compounds that, that harm people's health, reduced morbidity and mortality as, as a result. And though I didn't show it, we find that the benefits outweigh the costs in most cases. So benefits would be on health and environment, like we said, but also other things, uh, cash outlays for fuel, time savings because it's quicker to cook uh, with uh, clean and modern uh, sources of energy. So I'd happy to go into the, more of the details here as well during the panel discussion, um, but in the interest of time, I have to cut it off now.
So just want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators and our funders. This work was funded by the Clean Cooking Alliance and the National Institutes of Health. And I have collaborators from uh, North Carolina State University, the University of Liverpool, uh, a colleague from SEI, and a colleague from UC Berkeley. Thank you very much.